Okay, so um, let's begin. Uh, we're really pleased to have this webinar, uh, how Twilio and Sneak improved the developer experience. We'll be having uh, two speakers, uh, Asaf and Vlad, which I'll introduce in a minute. Uh, the webinar is gonna be recorded and we'll send you the recording and you can share it. So if anybody has intense fear of missing anything, there's no such issue. Um, you can use the Q&A button to ask any question. We'll probably answer the questions after uh, the session, but if something comes up and is really unclear, we may pop the question in the middle of, uh, of the presenter speaking. The first person to speak will be Asaf uh, Ehrlich. He's a staff software engineer at Twilio and has over a decade of experience in building tools and platforms for other engineers. Um, and he's currently working at Twilio as part of Segment's developer enablement team, where he focuses on the developer experience, and that's what he'll share. Uh, the team he's in owns building Segment's internal developer portal that uses Backstage, automated engineering laptop setup, deployment tracking, developer surveys, and managing internally deployed infrastructure for retool and source graph. And the second presenter will be uh, Vlad uh, Dubrovskis, he's an engineering manager at Sneak. And his, he's been working with DevX focused teams for the past five years and currently working at Sneak's infrastructure group, focusing on the internal developer experience because this is what this webinar is all about. The team's main focus areas are facilitating deployments across multiple environments, backstage adoption, Dora metrics, gathering insights to pinpoint how they can improve the platform experience and building custom tooling to ease developers' lives. Uh, Seth will begin. And after both of them, we'll have uh, Zora Annie, who's uh, Port's uh, co-founder and CEO, uh, present them with some questions. So I am going to uh, pass this over to Asaf. Asaf, the stage is yours. Thank you. Let me just get set up here real quick. Yeah. All right. Okay. Hello. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Asaf Ehrlich, and I'm a staff software engineer at Twilio on the Segment Dev Enablement team. Uh, Segment is a subsidiary of Twilio, and today I'm going to talk about how our team focuses on improving developer experience and by focusing on the developer journey. Quick intro about me. I have 11 years professional software engineering experience. I've worked at various places, including uh, AWS for five years as a deploy team, uh, three years at Groupon's Kubernetes platform team. And now I've been at Twilio one year and seven months. Um, I'm from Pennsylvania on the Eastern United States. And uh, in this picture behind me, I'm in the Hobbiton set in New Zealand. Uh, on the, uh, I'm a big Lord of the Rings fan, and, and this is one of the, the best vacations my wife and I had that I, I still think back fondly of. There's a lot of great sites to see there. I highly, highly recommend it. Like I said, today I'm going to talk about how our team thinks about the developer journey and how we use that to, to own, to decide what we own and what we, what we, how we prioritize our time. One of the first days on a developer's journey is configuring their laptop. Uh, when I joined, this was basically a long wiki page with a lot of manual steps, a lot of copy pasting of installation commands that were error prone. Our support had to spend a lot of time helping people through it. And so that's one of the reasons we decided to, to uh, make this experience better. Today, it's an automated uh, uh, laptop setup that is built on top of Ansible. It prints, it takes uh, less than 20 minutes now for the majority of that installation. It uh, walks you through and, and shows you in text what, what step each, what each step says, or what each step uh, does and installs. It has color coded output for whether it succeeds or fails and it's item potent. So it can, it can pick up quickly from where you left off if there's a transient issue. I also love that we have office hours where one of our, usually the on-call engineer will join and help people out with that with that second with every single engineer's second day uh, onboarding task. Um, even though you know we're there to help for our automation, a lot of times it's just 
fielding questions, people they have to ask, hey, I just joined this company. Here, here are some things I don't know, and we just try to help and give a human touch to everyone who's joining. On the next step of a developer's journey is often reading documentation, a lot of documentation and, and maybe reading a lot of code to get acquainted with, with their surroundings. Uh, discoverability is very hard, and before we improve this experience, this usually meant getting five or ten links to go through, reading them, uh, and you know this was an okay experience, uh, but you didn't. It, it it was still hard to to discover more. So we created a search tool that could comb through the majority of our documentation sources and help people to to using a keyword kind of get get a little bit closer to where what what page they need to know to find out more. Um, on top of that, we also own uh, the infrastructure for Sourcegraph, which is a third-party tool to improve the code search experience. It allows you to specify some private GitHub orgs and search through all the repositories with regex and, and other, other filters to help you find what you need. Uh, the next part of the developer's journey is kind of getting acquainted with what your team owns. What are the services that they own for each service? What is what is maybe the dashboard and runbook links? Um, maybe maybe what are your API docs? Who's on call? And what are other links you can go to? Um, before we centralize this experience, this usually involves bookmarking a bunch of pages that you have to remember. Um, kind of trying to learn a few CLIs or Bash scripts that you need to remember <laughs> to to use for certain situations. And it just became it's it's just. Without a centralized experience, it's, it's not as nice. And so that's why we chose Backstage to build a developer portal. Um, Backstage, as some of you know, is an open source framework that was built by Spotify and is now part of the CNCF. And uh, it, it basically has a cloud a plugin architecture that lets you kind of pick and choose a lot of open source plugins to tailor your for your developers' needs. So like one example is the PagerDuty plugin you see here that could show people who's on call. Um, and we've built a few internal ones that are, again, specific to our developers. There's a lot of possibilities for more we, we want to do with that, with that experience in the future. One of the next steps on a developer's journey is uh, building a service maybe for the first time and deploying it. Um, this, before we tried to improve this experience, it was quite hard. There was a lot of documentation uh, in order to get your first code to production. Um, it involved maybe we, you know about a CLI that we used to own to create a, a repository from a template. It usually did not uh, build successfully the first time. You did not have a container repository. There's a bunch of infrastructure you didn't know about you had to create first uh, and then configuration before you can actually deploy to Kubernetes and, and actually interact with your service. Uh, we recently launched this. Uh, it's one of the most popular features on, on our site that actually drives people to Backstage to actually build a service um, using, te using templates, which is a concept that, that Backstage has. Um, and actions that that you can that you can drive. So now um, uh, you can go there and create a service from a template. It asks the user for some input and then lays down uh, on top of that a container repository and a CI pipeline that every time it merges to master will publish that container image as well as the configuration to be able to deploy later. Uh, and one of our principals recently made a series of videos called Zero to Go Service in Kubernetes that walks you through starting that journey at backstage. And then, of course, there's lots of other teams and infrastructure along the way. Um, after you you run you you started backstage, you can he then walks people through the subsequent steps until you can actually deploy it and then interact with it and and and, and uh, watch even metrics in stage and production. Um, and we want to try to turn this into a training that that all new hires can experience in the future. One of the later steps on the developer's journey is actually working with other teams. Interacting with other services, that means you might need to know who owns them, who owns other services, um, maybe because you want to you want to learn about other services that are similar to yours, or maybe there are other use cases that that come up like you're a security engineer and you need to know all the all the languages that are out of date because of a vulnerability or all databases that need to be upgraded. Um, for some reason. And in the past, this involved kind of reaching out in Slack 
or getting contacts of people you know who are owners in this area and trying to find who's the owner and tracking down. And it was a kind of painful process. And we called this problem for a long time taxonomy that we wanted to improve upon. Um, taxonomy is a big word that basically means who owns all of the things and what are what are details about those things so that I can search by, by certain keywords. Um, so one of the reasons we went with Backstage is because it has this concept of a software catalog um, that you can onboard services to. We've so far onboarded 200 plus of those services and any, any service that's created with Backstage automatically gets onboarded as well, which is nice. Uh, an example that you can, you can actually create relationships in those services. So one example here on the right, a team created a service and said, it depends on five other components. Um, the nice thing though, is you can, what, what's really beautiful, you can actually extend this concept. This, this kinds of the relationships and graphs that Backstage has the power to, to add to its catalog. We've recently started ingesting Workday data. So um, Workday is, is just another third party tool that can have employee information in it. So here we, we pull in employee information such as the user's email and level you can look up. And we've, we've just started adding team data into the catalog. So with teams, we started adding those relationships between what, what is a, 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 the team part of or, or, what it, or, or owning. So um, here we have an example on the bottom where the deploy team, which is a sister team to DevX, uh, it owns some services and it's part of developer platform, which is part of infrastructure org. Uh, and there's just so many exciting possibilities in the future with the catalog, like adding infrastructure data and, and cost data. Asaf, a very interesting question came in, so I'll, um, I'll um, barge in with it. Uh, Ian is asking, what difficulties did you encounter when mapping the Twilio mental model to the backstage entity model when you created the software catalog? So if you could address that here, that would be great. Sure, that's a great question. Um, it's challenging. Uh, I think that in in it's a it's a case by case basis. Uh, some entities mapped uh, like reasonably well and other ones like it involved a bit of a you know a design process there was a design doc a discussion we actually this is hard because um i kind of mentioned like we're a subsidiary of, of twilio's segment we own a backstage instance there's actually multiple backstage instances at twilio that different uh platform teams for like different large groups own uh, which is complicated. And basically we had to create uh, an ADR, an architect design reference that um, was agreed upon by all, by all of the Twilio groups for how to generalize entities and what data like each entity will have to map to something like GitHub teams or map to something like uh, internal teams or mapping to, or mapping to certain infrastructure that that is coming up. So there's like each one of these re requires a bit of like thinking and what data do we want there and what data like is general, what's specific, um, but it depends on each, each one of case by case basis. But great question. One of the, the final ways we try to help on developer journey is of course providing support and then, and then asking people what works and what doesn't. Um, we've always had a support Slack channel and we try to create a, a SLO that we, we hold ourselves to of answering any, any question within an hour uh, during work hours. Um, this is often about our tools, but because we're the pane of glass, both with Backstage and, and with our support for the rest of the infrastructure org, a lot of times people come to us with just general questions and they don't really know the root cause. And we try to work with them to figure out what's the best team that can help them and route them to the right location. Um, on top of that, be before we had a centralized experience, we didn't really have good data on what, what parts of our tools people liked, what features they cared about more or less. But now that we have a centralized de developer portal, we've, in this example, installed uh, the Google Analytics plugin, which lets you pipe uh, data on on lots of things about how what what features are used more or less. An example here is looking at page views. What pages are people visiting, uh, and 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 what and the, and that kind of data can really show us and help us. And finally, we recently started doing a quarterly survey. Uh, we're now doing it for for the second time, uh, technically the third time for this coming year. And um, this really gives us some great new insights. Um, DX is a third party company that we've partnered with to, to deliver this. And then that helps us both see on a team level and aggregate level and also see long-term, did this initiative that we 
that we went about trying to improve this experience, did it actually work or not? And in conclusion, this is a small glimpse to how our team approaches improving developer experience at Twilio. I hope you enjoyed and I'm happy to continue answering more, more questions. Which we indeed, indeed will answer more questions. Uh, it seems to me that Vlad has a ton of questions um, sure. because I keep seeing his chat comments. So uh, Vlad, it's your turn. So uh, share your presentation and go ahead. Cool. Um, yeah, I think, um... To set the scene maybe a little bit, um, the developer experience team at Snake is, I say, new, relatively new. Like we, we've we've been together for about eight months, um, and our last engineer uh, joined us about four months ago. So I think a lot of things that, as I just presented, uh, I'm going to be talking about like from a bit earlier stage in that journey. Um, so let me let me start. Cool. Uh, I'm assuming you can see my screen. If not, please do shout. Um, so hello, everybody. My name is Vlad. I'm a junior manager for DevX um, team at Sneak. Um, and today I'm going to cover kind of where do we sit in organization and why, some of the challenges uh, that we encountered in our like seven, eight months that we exist as a team, and some of the future plans now we understand things a little bit better, kind of like what do we plan to do in the 2023. Um, and to begin with, just kind of to say this as well, like kind of what is Sneak? Hopefully you've heard of us. If not, uh, Sneak is like a secu um, security software uh, that uh, helps you stay secure. Uh, it does so by finding, like automatically finding and fixing vulnerabilities in your code, infrastructure as code, containers, um, et cetera. Um, and because we're software as a service company, we have loads of engineers using our software across the globe in different companies, mostly focusing on engineers. But also, um, we have loads of engineers inside the company building Sneak, right, day in and day out. And we, like our team, is supporting the engineers that are building Sneak. Um, the way we are set up is the way we've been in the organization. Uh, we are part of the platform division, uh, infrastructure group. And actually, in the same group, we are, we're sitting alongside SRE team and cloud platforms. Um, and kind of like if you might be wondering why an inf infrastructure group, like uh, I'm going to be referring to something called Polaris. Uh, this is what we call our internal developer platform for managing numerous production environments. Um, it's Sneak's platform as a product because Sneak has got multiple live environments, not a single one because we have, because of different regulations in different regions, et cetera. Um, and it's like a standardized and opinionated way of using new tool, like the tools we provide that enables repeatable sneak. So if we need to like spin up a new instance of sneak somewhere in a new region, we can do it in an automated way. And what Polaris kind of supports and provides developers with is things like to help them with their deployment, testing, security, role, maintenance, monitoring, and alerting. So kind of our focus as a team is mostly on Polaris and developer experience um, for new and existing services. But two other um, kind of areas where we're focusing on is also a service catalog, also backstage, uh, where we have service templates, uh, also focusing on documentation, trying to improve that, and like a few other bits and bobs there. And the third kind of area of focus is engineering insights, which kind of also goes to two, two different buckets, because one of them is about like gaining insights to optimize engineering efficiency of flow. So example is Dora metrics. And actually, we had some success with that in our company by where like senior stakeholders use Dora metrics to uh, prioritize some of the technical depth. So like we had some decomposition work to do and uh, the data we, like in dashboards we created had been, have been used to kind of justify that and, and prioritize it, which was very nice to see. Um, and the other bucket is like user interviews and like surveys, et cetera. Like, I, I call it, you know, like UX box of tricks, right? Like, like we're borrowing those things. We're not inventing ourselves. We're kind of borrowing it from, from uh, user experience overall. Now, in terms of challenges that we kind of encountered in our short journey so far, um, I think the first one is around managing expectations because the moment people hear like we have a developer experience team, people will go, great, we have a DevX team. They're going to fix everything, right? Well... I mean, you know, like we, we like any other team are, you know, have a limit on how many things we can do at one time. And kind of like few things that really helped us along the way is kind of, uh, sorry, defining a mission and focus area, right? Like, so our mission as a team is like that we believe that developing a sneak uh, should be a pleasure with safe and intuitive paved paths. And the focus area where we're focusing that is our internal platform Polaris. Again, because we 
like we're not the only team in the group and we don't own all the moving pieces of Polaris. We also like one of the things that really helps us is understanding our domain and ownership because we need to understand like what is the SRE team is responsible for, what a cloud platforms are responsible for and what DevX is responsible for, like which moving pieces. Um, once you have that, you learn to say no and you learn to say no quite well, right? Because as a developer experience team, the last thing you want to do is not to be helpful because you are there to serve the engineers and to help them, right? But you have to say no sometimes. And one of the things that can really help with all of the buff is like aiming to have a roadmap. Because if you have a roadmap and you put things there in a visible way, it can save a lot of time and a lot of kind of conversations and, and, and effort for everybody. Um, the, the next thing that we kind of encountered, can encounter as a challenge is especially when you start a team like this, there's a lot of foundational pieces that need to be done, right? I can build because like when you start, what kind of where we started, we didn't really have any feedback loops, like real feedback loops, right? Like you can hear, like we have ideas, people have what needs to be prioritized, but we had to think about like, how do we do surveys? Um, how do we use uh, like a user interviews? We also have like a support channel and we had to analyze data there to understand like, what are the most common asks to help a prioritize like a uh, focus for us? Um, or when like a support ticket is completed, we also do a survey automatically to ask the person like, hey, did you get the right answer? Are you happy with it? What could be improved? Again, like that, just like an extra thing where we can like feedback to our team to help us prioritize things. Uh, data insights, like engineering metrics like Dora, th that, that was like the first uh, thing that the team has built um, and it has been quite good. F like further down the line, we have ideas for developer satisfaction. Um, we even have some not very nice ways to, to find out like kind of what is the latest version of internal software being used. And again, something we plan to improve and m make a lot more automated at the moment, a bit of a manual step. Um, one kind of like something that um, has have touched on, um, it was, uh, they call it taxonomy, but like kind of bringing order and structure. I, we call it like metadata structure and validity, right? Because if you go into data insights and start to, like try and collect the data, you want to make sure that you can reason with it and you can describe it somehow and you can attribute it to like different teams or groups, et cetera. It's, it's like, it's going to be a very interesting challenge. We have some ideas and we implement a few things, but it's going to be, again, like something we're going to be looking um, forward a lot more. And actually overall, because we are part of the platform team, right? Like thinking about platform capabilities, because sometimes you need to understand kind of the challenges that exist and what platform capabilities might be missing because you might be building something right now that is not like super exciting, However, it might unlock value further down the line to kind of optimize flows and like help help developers along the way. Um, I'm glad uh, the yeah. fact that you said Dora metrics uh, just created a flurry of questions. So I'll go with the first one. Um, how are you All gathering right. Dora metrics and other developer experience insights? And do you maintain your own data pipeline to ingest this data? Uh, uh, so yes. So then I'll ask okay. another one. Okay, so with that one, yes, we do have. So we do have our own data pipeline. Uh, we we use the data from our CI/CD. We use Circle. So we 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 kind of uh, go for APIs. We collect the data. Uh, we structure it, and then we put it into uh, Looker and Snowflake, where we can like reason with that data. Um, for incidents, we didn't have like incident data for a while, but now we have like a. Um, a vendor for like managing incidents. This is going to be the next thing to add, which was missing so far, which was frustrating. But yeah, we do it. Uh, we do it ourselves. Like we kind of, we don't use a third party tool. We we kind of understand how things connect and we try to surface the data. And there's an there's another question here, which is quite long about engaging with a user interviews. So I'll just just drop us a sentence or two about how you do user interviews, if you do them at all, and then we may return to that later in the Q&A section. Uh, yeah, with user interviews, it's something, um, I'm going to touch a bit on that a bit, a bit later on, um, kind of um, not as a challenge, but as, as something, like nobody on the team is an expert UXer, right? Like it's something we are doing, we're trying for the first time, we we kind of you know we know it might not be ideal so we we kind of we, we thought about it like the questions we want to ask and the first survey we did like with the user interview, sorry, not survey, user interview we did we found i think we found 20 candidates and then we created some of the personas and we tried to map them like for example you know like a software like an associate engineer who just started their career like somebody who is a senior engineer or staff engineer and maybe at a front-end engineer. Like we try to talk to a variety of people asking the same questions to get some of the kind of, to see for trends, like kind of like what is difficult at the moment. Um, and then we plan like once we identify those areas, we're gonna have a follow-up chat with them to kind of 
dig a bit deeper to understand further opportunities. Um, but the, 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 I can talk about it for hours. It's a very big topic. <laughs> and a difficult one, I understand. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, back to the slide. So one other thing is like, you know, like team focus time, right? Like, I think it's unreasonable for any team, to be honest, like to expect like that 100% of your time is going to be coding, right? But I think like for DevX team, like this is like the breakdown I borrowed from um, my my manager, like Crystal. Um, she done a similar uh, kind of chat about like, where the, does the time go for different teams and platform? And the idea that kind of for DevX team, an approximate breakdown will be like 10% will be like like consultancy work, like with other teams, 24% for advocacy and training, for example, like kind of new cool features of the platform, 10% about focusing on documentation, 10% planning and architecting, because obviously we always have to do uh, things like this. About 30% like building and integrating, right? Like it doesn't all mean always building new tools, sometimes like just having a vendor integrating it with our existing tools. And probably about 20% goes to operating, right? Because the things you build, you can't just leave them alone. You have to, you know, sometimes update things, sometimes add features, sometimes things just break. Just part of part of software, software lifecycle. Um, and the last thing kind of like into the challenges I want to touch on very briefly is like, in DevX team, kind of like, what is the expertise versus good enough? And like, what is the expertise needed, right? Like, because I, I believe like DevX is kind of at intersections of technologies and approaches, right? Like, this is just like from our last seven uh, months as a team, the technology we use with like, you know, Kubernetes, AWS, GCP, like different cloud uh, providers, Helm, Terraform, you know, for data, we had Looker, Snowflake, nobody had experience with that. For languages, we had to do Python, Golang. JavaScript, both Node and React. Again, thank you for Backstage because now, now we have to do React. Uh, and like we had to wear loads of different hats, like being a data engineer, user research and analyst, product, like tech lead because people need um, to focus on that. And it can seem like can seem very, be like quite daunting. I personally think it's quite exciting. But at the same time, like, you know, as a manager, I think it presents a challenge of like, there's no perfect hire, right? Like for certain roles, it's very clear, like what are expectations? Here, the context, the situation, the roadmap at the time will uh, it will require the team to adapt, uh, and it's something like I think is quite important to like, kind of like be open minded if you want to be like working in a DevX team. Um, very briefly, I, I think I'm taking too much time already. Possibly future plans. Um, so the first thing, like that, kind of like more main thing we really want to focus in the next year is. Reducing the cognitive load. Like we want to abstract API surface to a high level. When we done some of the user interviews, one of the things we learned is that most developers, they just want to focus on delivering the value, like, 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 you know, working with features. They don't really want to navigate infrastructure or think about how to provision a database. They want it to be easy. It's not something that is like currently super easy, uh, you know, uh, but, and there's opportunities uh, at Sneak where we can make it a lot easier to kind of like have like a super simple, like abstraction layer. And we have some plans for that. I think at the moment, actually, kind of, uh, my team is looking into like doing a hackathon, trying to put like a few ideas out. As part of that as well, kind of one of the things that we have to do is like, we provide different uh, Helm charts and Terraform modules for, for databases, like to, to spin up a database for your service, for example. And because, they need to be maintained over time. If a new feature gets added or, or kind of a breaking feature, one of the tricky situations happens is that like at the moment, the teams need a bit of handholding, right? Because it's a scary high risk change. And again, something we want to do is make it easier and not high risk, make it something very normal. Um, and because like, because of the first two kind of main points, when you have so many, like if you have like high level abstraction and you have loads of systems underneath, when things go wrong, you want to make sure that the error propagated back to the user, like to your developer, doesn't send them on a quest, right? Like to the sh like from the Shire to, to the Mortar. I also like Lord of the Rings. Um, so yeah, like that's kind of something to be very mindful about. Um, next thing about, I think, again, we done Dora metrics, but we have a, a lots of plans for engineering, in, engineering insights overall. Kind of the idea is like to help create visibility across all layers of engineering, like from devs to VP, making engineering metrics visible and tracked over time. The value for engineers is like, I'm pretty sure probably everybody had experience with like, you know, production readiness checklist, right? Like you usually have like a document somewhere where there's 20 things and you have to read and understand each one of them. And it's, it's never a pleasant experience, right? With things like Backstage, you can automate most of those checks. So you can go to, to like to your service and immediately see green ticks or like uh, red ticks against them and say like saying what you need to do, right? Like it can be automated for developers. For directors and MVPs, 
you can answer things like, how is certain migration going? For example, like, yeah, like if there's a vulnerability in some kind of package, like you want, want, want to kind of track it, we, we will be able to provide that. Again, like we have plans for that. Nothing implemented yet. Talk to me in about six months time. There'll be a really cool story to tell. Uh, for Dev Portal, just one more slide of this, I promise. Um, Again, like tech insights and scorecards, I think has got huge potential for both engineers and also for directors and, v and uh, kind of uh, VPs, like at all levels of engineering. Um, service templates, we have currently um, two, service te two service templates, one for Golang, one for Node. But I think they can be used for much more than just creating a service. I think like, again, because it's automations, like you can automate any steps. Um, one of the things we're going to be doing as well because we have like some some custom things in our open API, we want to kind of create a better kind of rendering for our engineers to surface certain details. And again, from more user research point of view, we want to understand like, what do you want to present you with depending on like, what hat are you wearing? Are you wearing a hat of, hey, I'm an engineer responsible for the service versus, hey, I'm an engineer who wants to integrate with the service and understand how to consume it. Um, and the final one, is again, like something we haven't done yet, like a proper survey, but absolutely focusing on having that is like a repeatable way to track impact over time, because that will help us understand like, and ask some questions like, what is getting in the way of delivering customer value for the teams? And overall, are developers happy to work at Sneak? Like for example, something like an NPS score. Okay, I'm almost out of breath, but that's all from me. <laughs> so that's, that's like the coolest uh, ending slide ever. Um, and I'm going to share the Q&A slide, or maybe Vlad, share your slide. It's actually much nicer. And we'll go into the Q&A section, uh, let, but I actually cancel it. Try to try again. Um, I want to uh, have, we're going to start with the Q&A section with uh, Zohar asking, but um, it seems like uh, both of you want to ask each other questions. So maybe... Vlad, you ask Asaf a question, and Asaf, you uh, return a question, and then we'll go into Q&A. Okay. I mean, I can go first, because I like while uh, Asaf was presenting, I think that there was lo 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 loads of very interesting things um, really there, which I, I um, kind of like, I think one of the like really interesting things that I, I, I found when you were talking about, like was like, we call it metadata, I made, made, made a note and you call it taxonomy, which for me, I was like, this is such a big topic. Again, like can probably be a separate topic because it doesn't seem like something super exciting when you start thinking about it first, because you go, oh, taxonomy and metadata, but like the amount of kind of value it can unlock and the amount of insights is amazing. Yeah, I, I mean, this is something that like uh, certain people in my in in my group in in Develop Platform uh, have been very excited about for a long time, and have tried really hard to sell other parts of the company on how important it is, and uh, we're kind of solving it for ourselves first at Segment. And I think that as time has gone on, other parts of the company have become more and more interested because, like you said, it sounds almost boring at first, but so many situations people need to look up information about ownership or, or information about, about products or, or services and, and who owns and, and like, um, the, there's just a lot of possibilities. Uh, if you keep expanding down that road, just keep pulling that thread that, 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 that you can build on. And this half, your question. I guess like um, my question is, is similar about 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 more more about uh, Dora metrics and like um, getting uh, getting like developer maybe interviews and figuring out. I think I think Dora metrics kind of has two two use cases. Like there's the I want to audit every single deployment. I want to during an incident, be able to figure out what has changed. And, but then, and, and then the other use case is like, I want to know how developers are doing. And I think like they kind of get mixed together, but they're different use cases. But yeah, like you kind of touched on this in the presentation, but I, I want to know more. So I don't know what more you can share. Um, yeah, I, th I think, yeah, I th like those are definitely like the core, like core use cases there. But I think like, 
I think like, you know, like it depends, like, again, like, I think you have to think about kind of like who is using it, right? Like, and again, like things, again, UX tricks or product tricks, like, you know, like what is the persona that, that is, is consuming Dora metrics, right? Like, as you said, like, so, like during an incident, like you're an incident responder, like you can consume it in a way to tell you what changed, right? Like very quickly, like surface that, that information up, um, as a team, like maybe as an engineer, you you you, you can go look in the, in the in the data and you go like, wait a second, like it seems to be like you know like we're not doing that well, but actually like maybe it's okay, right? Like you can have like those meaningful conversations. Like a, a very good example I've heard before was like you know like oh like you know like we're deploying so many times a day, but actually the incident rate is very high as well. So maybe it's not a very good thing. Maybe like you should consider like maybe not deploying as often, but like think about the quality and like kind of like the. Um, kind of change failure rate to go a bit, a bit like, you know, like in the, in a different direction. Um, yeah, I, I, but I think also like, I think Dora obviously kind of, you know, through Accelerate uh, book um, became very popular, but I think like it only, you know, like it's a, it, I think it's like a small piece of the puzzle. I think like scorecards and tech insights, I think, and again, with, with taxonomy, I think can answer so much more. Um, is, is those, you know, like a kind of, one of the conversations I had with somebody recently, the the biggest challenge in the engineering teams, right? Like, and tell me if that sounds familiar or not. You go like, hey, we should like do 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 this cool feature because it's gonna you know help engineers move faster. And you go, okay, how are you gonna measure it? Uh, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, it's probably gonna, you know what, it doesn't matter because trying to like measure it is probably gonna take longer than building it. And then you cannot prove you can build it, right? But if you can make those kind of that data like available right away and you have a question you can answer right away just like product does right usually i think that that will enable teams a lot more i don't think like maybe it doesn't seem obvious straight away but i think like if you surface that those metrics i think it can really help you have like you can empower engineers to prioritize certain things a lot a lot more and a lot better that's that's a great point i've heard a term in the wild more recently called observability driven development to kind of capture what you're saying a little, like you should think about how you're going to measure this before you release it. Um, and I, I, I love that. That's a good way to put it. I'm taking note, observability driven development. Um, and now we'll move uh, to some more questions and answers with uh, Zohar. So Zohar, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, so uh, I really enjoyed your your session here. And, and uh, one of the questions that we got was, um, how does uh, developer experience play with uh, with the DevOps teams? Essentially, I think that originally developer experience was part of the um, DevOps respons responsibility. So, how does it play with with uh, you know high familiarity with infrastructure and stuff like that? Uh, I guess I'll go first. Uh, so, and in our org, the developer. Uh, experience is one of three teams part of developer platform. So other the other two teams are are CI and deploy, and then there are three other platform teams that make up the entire infrastructure org, which are um, compute platform, observability platform, and the data platform. So you can kind of see how we're kind of at the top layer. Um, and like I said, we kind of sometimes we triage a lot of support and then send yeah. to them, um, and you can kind of imagine what things compute observability and data own relative to ours. Cool. Um, another question that we got is, um, let's see. Um, so basically yeah, a lot of questions that we, that you already answered. Um, I think one of them would be like, are there some guides for internal developer surveys, like uh, some tips or do's and don'ts that you that you learned from doing servers surveys? I have not done the survey, like you know, like our as I said, like our team hasn't done surveys yet. We have some ideas. We've done some groundwork. Um, I think I'll, I'll be interesting to to hear a bit more from 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 Atav because I spoke to uh, getdx.com because I know they do it uh, the surveys and like they kind of have. I think they 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 take a lot of uh, groundwork off your hands, so you don't have to do it. You just kind of like pay for the solution. Um, so I'm quite curious, kind of like yeah, um, Asaf's experience. Yeah, so I'll start. I'll start off with where we were before before we did uh, before we got a hold of D DX and started doing developer surveys. We went through a, a round of like. Um, 
I would say six months to a year, but I wasn't part of the leadership team that did this. We did like basically listening tours slash interviews with all the product teams. Um, mm-hmm. This kind of hearted a very big company scale, but it was a good a good way for us to also introduce ourselves uh, at least one time to a to or rebrand ourselves because we used to actually not have a developer platform and have an experienced team. We there was a team before. And that kind of just was called the tooling team and own things. Uh, but that became harder to scale. So I think quarterly service is better. Uh, my biggest recommendation, like, so uh, DX kind of uses this to some extent, but there's a there's a, a framework called the space framework that Nicole Ferguson, uh, doc, uh, PhD, she, she wrote this article. I, I reread it recently. So it, it kind of tries to explain like this, like what, you should ask uh, on on something like quarterly survey. It, the space framework, each one stands for something like, uh, sorry, I wrote it down somewhere. I can find it. Um, satisfaction, performance, activity, communication, collaboration, and efficiency and flow. And in each one on, and this is like available online to read, they have example like questions or topics on a rating scale that you can ask. So that's like really inspirational if you don't want to go to DX and, and I, I'm not here to sell them uh, yeah. to you. Like uh, there are other solutions out there and you should evaluate, but like, that's a good start, like as a, as a good uh, starting point to ask those things. And uh, I think it's, I think it can give you a lot of, a lot of good, good starting insight. Um, I think just to kind of like, cause uh, one of the chats I had uh, in a meetup a month ago, don't remember the company name, I forgot, but what they said, they're using like, yeah, another kind of a, a completely different tool, not focusing specifically on DX, but just focusing on customer satisfaction, right? And and measures def- different sentiments. An interesting observation they, they kind of shared was that because it, it gives you different um, scores for different things. And they tried that like different things, like not nothing had very, like very big impact until they started focusing on one measure, which is happiness. Like, are people happy? And it sounds really weird, but apparently, like, as when they started, like, focusing on that and how to improve that kind of, like, developer, developer life, it really helped, like, move other metrics ahead as well. Um, it's a it's a sample size of one I've heard from, you know, just saying, I'm just sharing. Uh, <laughs> and Amazing. I mean, yeah. Go one ahead. more thing, like, I absolutely, I, I may, may know that I absolutely loved kind of the listening tour, like you said, like, you, you know, you, you like, I, it's something I'm definitely going to borrow because I, I think like one of the, one of the interesting concepts I learned in last year uh, from uh, my, my manager, Crystal, is like, I'm not sure if you've ever heard about four types of work and it's like kind of work as imagined, work as uh, prescribed, work as disclosed and work as done. Mm-hmm. And I think like service versus observing versus listening, like they help you see different types of the same work to get like a better insight um so i I would say like you know like don't just do survey like you know like if you do those things like do a collection of them to have a better understanding amazing um yes so 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 basically uh we're we're out of time and i i want to personally thank you for uh for making time for this session i personally i really enjoyed um uh, the points that you brought up and learned a lot and i hope that we manage to make uh, developers a little bit happier uh, every day. Uh, so, so I want to really thank you for, for that and the participants. And um, I, I, we did not not cover all the Q&A. We had like a lot of questions coming in, but I hope we touched the, like the, the main points. And um, we will follow up with, with, a, with, um, with, a, with a recording of this session. So, so don't worry about that. Uh, you, can, uh, you, can, um, you can listen it uh, also offline. And thank you everyone for, for joining us, us for this session. And um, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for hosting. And and this was a pleasure for, for me as well.